I am a huge social media consumer, and uh, I, 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 I see some headlines that kind of generate my interests around data science, and, and I think some of these are headlines that you've all heard before. Data is the new oil. Who's, who's heard that one? I think that, yeah, The Economist, right? Okay, next one. I am a data scientist, and my starting salary was $105,000. Does that ring a bell for anyone in the room hiring data scientists or maybe planning a budget for one? Okay, what does that say? Data science talent is scarce, and it's expensive. So here, here's the next one. Chasing big data and the data science unicorn. What does that say? That's a Forbes headline. Data science unicorns, right? We heard Ian talk about that from JP Morgan this morning, right? Skills are hard to combine. We've seen probably many Venn diagrams of statistics, programming, and consulting, and, and the mix of the three. So those are, those are hard to combine, all right? OK, how about next? 85% of big data projects fail, uh, right? And it can kind of make, makes you a little bit nervous if you're a leader in the space or if you are incoming talent into the space. And then finally, companies are falling behind in their efforts to become data-driven, right? That's a big reason why we're here, not that we're failing, but that we're trying, right? That's a, that's a Harvard Business Review article. So some thought pieces to think about and I want to do a quick poll here before I introduce my panelists, who um, are very good looking and are not uh, featured here on the, on the slide. Um, and they have more hair. Um, who in the room has had a conversation with a business leader or someone in HR where you've mentioned that you're working on data science projects? Show of hands. OK, let's see, maybe about a quarter. How many of you in the room are in People Analytics Center of Excellence or a Business Analytics Center of Excellence where you have somebody that is a data scientist or they have the title of a data scientist on your team? Show your hands. OK, that's, that's slightly more out of it. I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit of a funnel here. Please keep your hands up. OK. How many of you? have a dedicated data science pillar with differentiated roles. You have people that do data engineering. They connect the pipes between systems. You have people that do natural language processing and sentiment analysis. And you have people that do predictive analytics who have di differentiated roles. Take a look around the room. OK. So we had a little bit of a funnel there, but uh, maybe that's about a quarter to, um, went from about a half to about a quarter of the room. And so what I think this means is that there's a, there's a talent discussion to be had in HR analytics and, 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 and data science in general. And I would like to get a perspective of ideas. So I've got three brilliant panelists here in the room to just have a fireside chat. And then we'll have a little bit of time at the end to have a discussion. Um, with your questions as well. So could I please welcome Katanjali, Carissa, and Francesco up under the stage. Round of applause, please. All right, team. So about a minute, two minutes apiece, please. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your team, and how did you get to doing what you love to do today? Absolutely. Thank you, Bennett. So hi, I'm Gitanjali Gamal. And besides being really good looking and brilliant, <laughs> as Bennett said, um, I actually I lead uh, the modeling and insights team uh, as part of workforce analytics at Johnson & Johnson. So what my team does is essentially what you would call advanced analytics. So I have a team of behavioral scientists and data scientists. Uh, their backgrounds range from stats to IO psychology to uh, physics and math. So, so we have it all, and we love the diversity of experience that they bring to the team. And I think it really adds to what um, we're able to do for our organization and what we hope to achieve. Um, and in terms of how I got here, um, so I've always been very, um, I think, very good with data and being able to get insights out of a lot of information. 
And on the other end, uh, what I really love is people. I'm actually genuinely interested in people and hearing about their stories and what motivates them, what you know annoys them, just trying to understand that. And being able to put all that together and actually get paid for it was awesome. So um, people analytics is definitely something that, that I'm very fortunate to be part of and glad to be here. Hi, I'm Carissa Shafto. And I work at Brightfield, uh, which is a software as a service company. Uh, so I, I run what we call our data factory, uh, which is taking data in lots of different forms from different types of systems, um, transforming um, and getting it all into some format where we can aggregate. Um, and then in the end, we have a platform called the Talent Data Exchange. Whereas a company, if you provide your contingent workforce data de-identified, we will aggregate and we will analyze and then provide to you how your data compares to other companies, other roles that are similar, uh, et cetera, across the market, um, both uh, across around the world. So um, I uh, am uh, a data scientist by training. So I have a PhD in experimental psychology. And I worked in higher ed for a long time and was very interested in using data science techniques to improve uh, education. Uh, I then pivoted uh, because I'm very interested in HR, where I see in particular where our, our um, diversity gaps um, in technology. I think a lot of that really boils down to HR um, as being the place where those things can be addressed. So I was specifically very interested in getting into HR and using data um, in terms of how hiring is made and the kinds of decisions that people make about who they have at their company. My name is Francesco Rulli. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Querlo. We're also partners with Forbes Insights for AI solutions. Um, basically, the, our motto is uh, artificial intelligence with a heart. We try to build solutions that get closer and closer to the human uh, empathy and uh, provide a certain level of comfort into the conversations. Uh, so we are focused on conversational artificial intelligence. I started this journey back in 2011 when um, I decided to build 13 classrooms in Afghanistan. Uh, we built uh, enough internet connections for over 50,000 girls in uh, high schools there. And uh, back in 2013, uh, we actually uh, had created an entire model of uh, education and uh, rewarding with Bitcoin. Uh, then the Afghan government took over those classrooms and left us with nothing in our hands. And it was our, you know, private funding. Uh, so at the same time, IBM had purchased this company called SoftLayer. My CTO called me up and say, hey, we got this thing called Watson, maybe we can play with it. So I said, why don't we build a couple of things uh, with AI to educate girls uh, remotely. And then we started doing the same also with boys. And we created a bunch of chatbots, uh, some more, some less intelligent. We did them in English, in Farsi, in Urdu, whatever it was, the language necessary. And uh, we decided that it was uh, interesting to, to transform this also into a non -for, uh, for pro actually a for profit initiative so back in 2015 we decided to launch this company called Querlo and uh, that's what we care the most is uh, to provide a platform to people to express their thoughts, uh, their, uh, achieve their aspirations, uh, empower them with artificial intelligence. Very different from the word that has been used before, management. So for us, it's about providing them a platform and then management comes, uh, you know, it's a natural progress. So that's where I come from. Thank you. Great. And so I'm really looking forward to getting the types of perspectives and the diversity of perspectives from um, our panelists. But I kind of want to start with maybe, maybe kind of a softball. I don't know. Maybe we all know this in the room, but I, sometimes I have no clue. What is different about this term data science from analytics? And where do you draw the line? I, I, I thought this morning it was quite interesting um, to listen to Bridey talk from ING talk about this idea of scale. And sometimes that can be the, the reason why you start hiring data scientists, but not all the time, right? You know, there's some of us in the room that raised our hands that we're working on data science projects, even though we don't have a data scientist on our team, um, but we're, we have that type of thinking. So what does that mean to you? What, what is the, what's the line there, or, or is there one? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think you're going to get as many different answers as people you ask. Uh, I don't think we have any one standard agreed upon definition for data science. And I don't know if we need to have it, honestly. Like, I don't, I don't know if we need to be uh, put like hard lines around it. Um, so interestingly, just, just to share, um, one of the initiatives that I'm part of uh, in my organization is an enterprise-wide data science initiative. And as part of that, I've been doing a lot of work interviewing data scientists and doing a lot of qualitative research. And it's been so interesting. Like There is so much debate within that community of what data science is. Is it bringing scientific practice? And some people think, no, it's not. It's actually the opposite of that. It's letting the data lead you. And, and you know, just it's, it's really interesting. Um, and of course, we've all seen sort of, um, you know, like you said, the Venn diagrams of the intersection where you're really good at one thing, but at least you know enough about software and stats, et cetera. Um, I think the one, in, in my mind, this is just my view, but uh, where there's probably a distinguishing factor than other maybe data-oriented roles or data uh, analyst roles um, is, is being able to work with large amounts of data and truly a lot of data and being able to uh, produce some um, useful insights from that. And by that, I don't mean that every data scientist needs to be an expert storyteller. I think that would be great, but I don't think that's an absolute requirement. I think that's why you have leaders in data science who can help enable that. But I do feel that at least being able to, like if, if the all the work that you do is on a spreadsheet, you probably don't need a data scientist to do it. But I think being able to work with large amounts of data and being able to find uh, you know, signals from from all of the noise. I think that's that's something I think is important. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that. Actually, I I think that's a nice distinction. Where um, in my company is an example of that, where it started out as a consulting company doing what you would call analytics and really building everything in Excel. Um, and the science part came when they were able to scale that and use different kinds of algorithms and different techniques to look for patterns that are otherwise difficult to find. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I think. Science, uh, I think, is an important part of it. So, so being able to be more rigorous about um, how you're looking at the data and the kinds of questions you can answer. Um, whereas, I think analytics tend to be a lot more descriptive um, and also smaller scale. Based on my experience, uh, we we've developed uh, over six thousand chatbots and conversational artificial intelligence solutions. Sometimes it's a lot more about identifying uh, that person or the group of people that are actually willing to get very familiar with the business, uh, follow what are, is the culture of the business, or kind of like take a little bit of a risk about predicting how they see the business going in the years to be. And uh, that goes into the conversation of uh, how do you empower someone who is going to be basically so relevant for the company because uh, a data scientist uh, is, is almost like a neuron within a brain in which uh, he has or she has to take a decision about uh, the values behind uh, certain insights and uh, has to create a new, um, uh, new hypothesis, uh, new opportunities of not just looking at the case APIs that have worked in the past, but come up with something. And as we started, Bennett mentioned, 85% of the times, that's a failure. So also, are, is someone that is empowered within the company to take risk and to fail, in which, especially in large corporations, it's a little hard to do. So. Right. There's a huge component of a data scientist's job to be uh, even a, a level above in some respects um, compared to uh, some analysts in terms of their bi the business context that they have in addition to those technical skills. So again, it's that Venn diagram. But we, we face constraints in our ability to employ data science talent. And employee means you can hire them, right? You can borrow them from other centers of excellence. We've heard today from other presenters that they are moving their people analytics function into a centralized analytics function. Um, or sometimes that partnership can be really important. Other times, uh, I was very fortunate, fortunate enough to lead a team going from a reporting type of um, a, a rhythm into a data science rhythm, and I was given the mandate to grow that talent. So there's kind of a trade-off with each one, and I know all three of you have an experience with um, the hire, buy, grow, or um, uh, otherwise just finding data science talent. So what's, what are the pros and cons? What are the trade-offs that you see? We'll go in a different order. 
Um, all right, so I'll give two different answers. Um, one is for inside our company, is in, and one is for possible customers, right? So um, a lot of the work that we're doing uh, on our, for our platform is not only um, are we analyzing your data as a company, but we're also analyzing hundreds of other companies, right? And so we can provide uh, insights that you wouldn't have access to on your internal team. And so there are cases where, you know, if you would say that's borrowing, right? Like uh, using that talent, using uh, those insights um, externally can add a lot more value than what you might be able to do internally, even if you have uh, more focused functions, um, because it's data that you don't have access to. Um, if, speaking more internally, uh, I think that um, we actually have a combination. Uh, so we have some functions that we have uh, that we partner with a third party. We have others where we have hired really junior people uh, and we're training them into other roles. Um, and we're also sim simultaneously trying to hire people uh, who are very senior who have done these things at other places. So uh, with very different goals in mind for each of those in terms of what we want them to do. So what, you know, just to add to that, I think, um, you know, definitely we all, any of us who have been out there hiring data scientists or trying to hire them, you know that's a tough thing to do, right? And especially when you think about the people analytics space. Um, and one of the reasons is, one, it's not, uh, you know, it's still relatively a newer space or newer in terms of how much people know about it. Um, I think sometimes people are very interested in the types of questions that we're solving, uh, and, and you know it's something that intrigues them, but sometimes they get worried that we don't have the kind of data sets or the size of data sets that then they'll be able to do effective work or they won't be able to use the kind of tools that they want to use to keep their own skills up. So I think there are some of those challenges, but those can be overcome. So definitely, you know, buying some of that talent, uh, you know, or borrowing, or I'll add begging in my case. I've done buy, borrow, beg, everything, steal. Um, but but I think the one piece where um, there's, there's not, I feel like, enough focus is grow. And I think that is a very, very um, seriously viable option for building up data science talent. It's not for everyone on your analytics team. They can all be equally smart. They can all have PhDs, and yet it's not for everyone. But there are some people who have the interest and the capability that they can be trained on um, anything from you know data science the way we know it to even aspects of data engineering, and they have the capability to pick that up. Um, and I think wherever there's an opportunity, that's, that's a great option to do that, too. So I would like to deconstruct uh, what a company is, is, a, is a conglomerate of people. And if we looked at what happens on LinkedIn, I think the very vast majority of people are on LinkedIn for themselves and then use the company as uh, one of their assets and it doesn't go the other way around. And uh, in, in also because I'm from Italy, so you know we think completely different from Anglo-Saxon mentality. So small business everywhere. Uh, we are totally incapable to build big companies. So obviously, I think in that perspective. And um, when I when I look at the data scientist, I'm thinking about her or his personal aspirations. Do, do we provide them a platform? It doesn't necessarily mean it's the money. It can also be the culture of the company or the opportunities. So definitely growing uh, uh, talent in within the company is very necessary. And the people within the company, just like this conference, have to be informed about the opportunities that data, artificial intelligence, all this stuff can provide them personally and in their lives. Last night, Bennett uh, and I, we had an exchange of conversations and I told him, listen, I'm going sailing this afternoon and this is my chatbot. And crazy enough, he went on the chatbot, he did his own little studies about who I am, and which is kind of crazy. But that chatbot saves me 36 hours a month, all right? And I, I do have my selling chatbot, I have my personal chatbot, I, I have a bunch of chatbots for business, but the reality is that I use that time for my personal aspirations, all right? We didn't win, we did three second places, which was okay. But the reality is that then I came back home late to take the train and come here. So, you know, sometimes 
understanding people's aspirations on a personal level and within the company, providing them the tools, and then leveraging that, then everybody's making more money, then everybody's happier. If not, at least we give them the freedom. So growing for me is definitely the priority. And then, you know, there's always also good to give a platform for the employee and the consultant to collaborate together and see if one can help the other, because there's a lot of things that happen within the company that the consultant doesn't know. So there is this need of conversation. And ultimately, you can actually use conversational artificial intelligence as a middleware between people sometimes. And I'll explain a little bit later more about that. I had no idea how much soft skills go into building a chatbot. Um, that's awesome. And, and so it, I, it makes me think a little bit more about what are the soft skills and the hard skills that a, a data scientist in HR must have, right? I think we, we talked a lot about consulting skills, understanding organizational people's needs, but th obviously there's a lot more to that, right? To be to be a data scientist, especially um, on on the technical side. So so what is that? And also in the context of a multicultural, multinational organization, um, which many of us here are are in that position, right? There's there's kind of a, a lot to unpack in addition to that. So what what do you all think? <laughs> I'll start. Um, so I think there's when it comes to technical skills, I think we're we're all fairly familiar with what some of those might be. I mean, everything from predictive modeling to NLP. I think you listed off quite a few. Uh, most of the ones that um, that would be relevant. I think in terms of being able to code, uh, you know, whatever their choice of of um, programming language might be. I think it's you know I'm fairly agnostic to to what they use. Um, uh, but you know, the, you know, people use Python or, or all kinds of different languages. I think those are definitely um, some things that are easier to identify, right? Or or know about, or know what to look out for when you're hiring someone. Um, I think soft skills is hard. And I don't even know if I necessarily call them soft skills um, because what I'm I'm thinking of when we say that for a data scientist in that context is more the ability to ask the right questions, uh, looking at the data they have, or being able to find out what matters and what doesn't, or if I present this analysis, or if I say these things are you know, what we need to action on, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? And again, I come back to, I think, depending on what level you're at, I think that varies. If you are someone who's early in career, just starting out, I think it's the role of their leaders in, you know, in their data science teams to be able to guide them to do that. But as you kind of grow, I think that is, that's sort of the soft skill that I'm thinking of. Um, you know, we've all kind of heard sort of the cliches around people who are good data scientists are not necessarily uh, the most sociable or, you know, they don't want to work in with other people. And I don't think that's true. I think that's a very, very uh, broad generalization. But I think um, in terms of soft skills, just being able to think of the so what and what does this mean? Like, how would we implement this in an organization? What impact would this have on people or their careers? How will we justify, you know, finding of this sort? I think that's something that I think um, I consider like an important soft skill. Did you want to go next? Oh, uh, yeah, so, so soft skill is definitely something that is a little harder to find, uh, combining the two aspects. Uh, we, we, we have had our problems sometimes, you know, and, uh, and it's part of the organization uh, goals, I think, is to, uh, to try to find the diversity within their team so that uh, you might have that genius that really knows how to create and uh, develop um, a software or a model, but the, uh, she or he might be an, really not good at communications and someone else that can act and help on doing that. So it's a balance of the two. Uh, a data scientist who understand the, the culture of the company and is a step ahead of everybody else in the company is very, very important. It also costs a lot of money and there is a lot of competition. Uh, the West Coast is taking all those brains away and uh, most banks don't know what to do because they can't get their own data scientists anymore because it's not just about money. So it's about culture. Can you allow someone to go in shorts and the skateboard and have a, their dog at work? If you work at uh, Goldman Sachs, probably not. So the guy is going to the West Coast. 
that's what we see every day. And uh, it's a choice uh, if you want to create that new culture within the company or you want to create a company uh, a couple of blocks south of uh, your headquarters that has a different culture. That's it. Yeah, and something I think is important uh, that also can be tricky um, is finding folks who are willing to um, willing to get feedback before things are finished and willing, right? So that that trade off between um, a sort of more academic way of working where you can just really dig in and go and go and go for a long time, right? If anyone who anyone else here who's done a dissertation knows you can spend a lot of time on the same thing. Um, but in business, right, that's just not practical. You have to do things, you have to have a minimally viable product, right? And so I, I, that can be a thing that I know for us, we, ha we can have trouble finding is that right balance of being able to dig in and having good ideas and knowing when to stop and saying, I've spent too long on this and now I need to come back and get feedback or regroup about doing it a different way because we have a thing that we have to actually produce. And I want to, we're almost a um, little getting close to um, time here, but I want to um, dive off of that point and a point that you made, Francesco, about this um, idea of retaining talent, right? Because um, as we saw, at, or as we heard at the beginning, data scientists are expensive and they're easy to lose. And so it's also very easy to make them miserable, um, and, and especially in a newer function like HR, so or in a new domain like HR. So. What would you say makes a data scientist miserable, and how would you solve that? Solve for that. Yeah, I I think um, if they have work, and I know we we're actively interviewing for data scientists right now, so I've been getting this question uh, from most of the candidates about how much freedom is there to explore new things um, and to um, you know to to contribute ideas to projects and how much of it is like pre-scoped uh, where they're sort of it's more like being tasked um, and so I think that's a way to make most of them really miserable like most of them have spent a lot of time studying things and most of them have a strong science background and so they're creative and intellectual and interested and they don't necessarily just want a task even if it's one that's complex um, if someone else has already scoped it out right so um, I would say you know an easy way to make uh, data scientists unhappy is to just give them really predetermined things and not a lot of freedom to, to do it in a way that might be better um, or just allow them more uh, opportunity to learn or be intellectual. Um, and, and that's a really easy thing to combat um, because if you're hiring them for their expertise, you should also be interested in taking their input on projects. And, and so uh, one of the things that, that I've kind of learned from my own experience and from speaking to various people who are in data science roles is um, actually quite, um, quite similar to what everybody wants, I think, is knowing that the work you're doing is making impact. I think that's something that I've heard over and over again, that uh, you know, they put in a lot of hard work, uh, try to be as innovative as possible, and they want to make sure that that work sees the light of day and seeing it in implementation, whether it's being productized or whether it's even making an impact to a small group, but knowing that, that that's being done, I think that's critical. Um, I think the other thing, which I think is um, maybe a, a, a next um, level, is, is also being able to keep their skills up. That doesn't necessarily always mean that they need to have the latest and greatest of technology all the time, or at least that's not what I think every data scientist wants. But I think they do want the ability to be able to either have the time to do that or or have the projects where they can learn new things, uh, learn new skills, or learn about a new area of work, um, and, and sort of grow their own portfolio of what they're doing. So I, I feel like those two things, if you don't have that, would really make someone miserable. Uh, the space of uh, HR, human resources, is probably as arised as the most important valuable space now. We have, we have my personal experience, we have built solutions from any, many perspectives, from uh, marketing, sales, and so on, et cetera. But HR is, is the core, is basically managing people's lives. And the big question is, uh, do you live to work or do you work to live, all right? And uh, it, sometimes, unfortunately, you know, it falls in the middle. It's not that you can just enjoy life and for the sake of it. But the, the data scientist has to be informed about how valuable their contribution is. Uh, has to be rewarded proportionally, but also because uh, sometimes I notice that they really like to see results, also to build uh, KPIs around uh, the results and the failures and give them uh, a safe space for them to 
to test and new signals and uh, figure out things that haven't been figured out before and uh, and build a relationship so that they feel they are part of the team and uh, uh, they have a pulse about where the company is going because the company is made of people and uh, people change their mood, you know, it depends on what time you get your coffee and if the coffee is good, your day goes different direction. So it's very important to t- keep that in mind. And the data scientist is the one who is supposed to figure it out and help the rest of the team. We all in our little life can become a data scientist in a certain way with our own. So it's also good to have the little bit understanding if you're not the data scientist assigned to the project, but a little understand what those guys go through and how the process works. That's all. Great. Purpose, space, and the encouragement of a curiosity is how I'd sum that up. Um, a, a much more positive way to frame uh, misery, right, or, or avoiding misery. So um, I do believe that this concludes this session. I'd like to thank our panelists for giving their diversity of perspectives. And feel free to find any of us for the questions that you wanted to ask in this question or in this session uh, anytime throughout the rest of the conference. So thank you so much.